Welcome back to theCUBE. We're here at Hadoop Summit in San Jose. Uh, beautiful sunny San Jose, as far as I know. It was nice this morning. I haven't been outside in a while, but... Uh, uh, we're it's still very nice. Jeff. Yes, I've got my uh, co-host, Abhi Mehta, filling in. Uh, Thank you. From Traseda. A guest, a guest co-host? A guest co-host. You know, we're, we're trying new things on theCUBE all the time. Uh, and our guest now is Chris Matman from uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA. Very interesting stuff. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, nice to meet you. Welcome to theCUBE. Uh, a painless painless environment, no, no worries at all. So, you haven't uh, hurt me yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you were just coming from uh, a talk you gave. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, just coming from talk. Why don't we share a little bit with our audience kind of what, what you were uh, talking about, and then maybe we can go into some of the use cases, things you're doing at NASA. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I basically was talking about um, some of the challenges, like some of our big data scenarios that we have at, um, at NASA, like for example, the Square Kilometer Array, which is an international project, the next generation radio astronomy instrument that's going to generate about 700 terabytes of data per second. Um, oh my which, God. Which we really don't understand. That, that's, say that again, 700 terabytes per second? Yep, per second. So that, that's, that's 15 times more than the uh, Large Hadron Collider. Yeah, and your math is better than mine, so. Because <laughs> <laughs> you wow. came up with that on the fly. Um, yeah, absolutely, it's, it's the largest, I mean, it's, we don't know what to, how, to, how to even deal with that. There's got to be yeah, a decade, wow. a decades of research to support that. So I was talking about projects like that, the U.S. National Climate Assessment, a lot of the work that we're doing related to that, and just, trying to motivate the development of technologies and the use of technologies like mm -hmm. Hadoop and, and, yeah. and, and other so, things. So can you talk about, uh, and, uh, and Jeff knows this, we've, we've seen Hadoop come from the web, this, this college industry project six years ago, 2,000 people behind us now saying, no longer college industry, this is a real industry. How does it change the game for you? You have a lot of, what were you doing before? And what can you do now that you could never do? Yeah, so I mean, what we were doing before, uh, well, what I was doing was was helping be one of the guys that helped make Hadoop. I was one of the original nutch committers working oh, with wow. Doug Cutting. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, in the open source world. Well, thank uh, you for be it. Before Hadoop got spun out. But yeah, but what we were doing before was basically building ad hoc systems, you know, having people haul a lot of data around, crunch on it locally, you know, instead of doing it in kind of a distributed environment and stuff. Mm -hmm. Hadoop, I think, uh, originally, it was very difficult to use and install, but was awesome. Only like the smartest people in the world could use it. Yeah. I think Hadoop is really moving into a generation where a lot of people can deploy it. You know, people are getting a lot of value and data and, and just insight out of it. And just anybody in, in the organization is being able to do that. And then that's, that's got to be where Hadoop evolves to. And uh, it's something I'm really, I think it's awesome, you know. Mm -hmm. So you know, obviously NASA has a rich heritage of uh, you know from in the uh, technology world, developing technologies and that eventually kind of make their way out uh, into the wider world. So, uh, talk a little bit about some of the experiences you've had and how they would relate to some of our audience who maybe you know they're not at NASA, they're at uh, you know <laughs> a, a a little less sophisticated uh, organization. Exciting job, yeah. You guys are giving us too much credit. Um, <laughs> no, for us, like I bet you, it's pretty similar even to business or to mm -hmm. you know other IT industries. Uh, you know, for us, it's just different data file formats and it's different things that are generating the data. You know, a lot of people, or a lot of companies like Yahoo or whatever, the data is being generated by users, like hundreds of millions of users that do clicks or whatever. But you can think of that in a way as something that is being observed and then some derived analysis that happens from that. For us, the thing that's doing the observing a lot of times, at least at JPL and at NASA, are our remote sensing instruments mm -hmm. that look at the Earth, that try and measure different parameters. You know, they're looking at surface albedo, you know, reflectance, and so, and they're looking at the measurement of or of snow in a particular pixel of the Earth, you know, yeah. and then it's basically the the things that are different are the data file formats, the you know the tools that operate on them. A lot of people here in the Hadoop community are you know there are users, they're Python right. users. We're not as sophisticated oh, a lot within you know NASA because a lot of the people that write our algorithms and our codes to crunch on the data, they're scientists that aren't mm -hmm. trained programmers. You know, ah. they pick up a little bit of programming you know along the way. And so that's, those are the main sort of differences. The differences are in kind of the variety, the velocity, the typical big data, right. you know, things, but also just in the nuts and bolts. But in the end, it's the same thing. It's generating data, gener uh, generating, you know, in our case, files or records, processing them, getting some insight. Our insight go into policy makers, they go into science research, right. they go into monetary decisions and mm -hmm. things like that, but. The, the, the team at, I have a, a related question for you. The team at uh, Wikibon and uh, Silicon Angle have done a great job, and Cube. Uh, we see that the emergence of what we're calling this predictive analytics movement, that it's not about what has happened, but being able to predict what can happen, what can right. you do in predict the data. As I'm, I'm assuming you at NASA with all the information do a lot of predictive analytics, but to the point you just made around, it's tough to find the skill set. Scientists are not programmers or vice versa. Right. At least not always. Right. Do, 
a, 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 a corollary to that is the open data movement. Right. Which is as you're collecting, 700 terabytes a second, I still can't get that over my head. <laughs> <laughs> 700 terabytes a second of information. Are you looking at open sourcing the data itself and, and inviting the smartest brains from the world to contribute to the intelligence you're seeking to find in that data? I think so. What do so. you think? Okay. I, I think so. I mean, NASA's data technically is, is, all of NASA's data is public. It's science research data. So all of the data produced by NASA, Earth science missions, by planetary, it's all eventually made public. For us, when it's not public typically, it's because it's, you know, it's protected ITAR information or it's just something that people wouldn't be able to crunch out in the open anyways. Uh -huh. But all of NASA's science research data is public. The difficulty a lot, what we see is that a lot of that data is specific to the instrument. You have to understand mm -hmm. a lot you know, about it. But as far as the data sets, all of the time people pick up NASA data and they figure out how to crunch on that. Um, it's just not, I don't know, I, I can't explain why people haven't just picked it all up you know, and said, oh, let's put all this onto Amazon and start dealing with it. But a lot of it has to do with politics and so forth, yeah. and also just making sure the data stays where it was originally generated, yeah. because a lot of the science expertise yeah. is there. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Yep. Uh, so for you know, for us laymen, you maybe uh, give us a couple of examples of where big data analytics has really had a you know an impact. Kind of give us the end result. What are some of the some of the insights maybe you've gleaned, or some of the th some of the uh, uh, you know analytics you've done that are really you know a, a lay person, a non NASA person could actually uh, understand. Sure. So I mean, I'll give you one example uh, by a guy named Dr. Tom Painter, who is one of my inspirations at JPL. He's a snow hydrologist. Basically, what he's he's working with the Bureau of Reclamation. He's working with the water managers in the Western U.S. and he's trying to figure out how to generate more accurate measurements of of snow melt mm -hmm. and uh, and and snowpack so that we can get better measurements of water so that we understand, that water managers understand how much water to release for mm -hmm. the coming season. Or mm -hmm. just people know what to predict in terms of um, uh, recreation and parks. Like parks and recreation is a $10 million industry you know, in Colorado and the western US, just people going and skiing and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't have snow around, people yeah. can't do that. And a lot of people that are in the money-making profit stream for that, you know, hurt. Yeah. So being able to generate more accurate measurements of snow and being able to use data systems and big data and, predict and analytics for mm -hmm. that is just something where I think we're seeing a lot of value on. It's contributing to the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Wow. You know, it's going into all of the climate reports and so forth. So that's that's something that's really fresh in our minds. So, so, so you think uh, to be a little bold that big data can help solve global warming? It's a big data problem. Uh, I absolutely think it's a big data problem, and I will be bold, and I think it can do that. Mm. Yeah, I think basically most of the work, you know, for running climate models is, you know, shipping data around, shipping right. computation around, all of the types of things, and then making, like you said, your predictive analytics was really great because a lot of NASA research is retrospective, Interesting. You're trying to learn a model from what is already existed, and people are kind of gun shy to make predictions a lot of right. times, because especially when they deal with policy and money and things <laughs> like point. that. But I think I'll just make a statement. I think that that's a big data problem and that's what we need to get there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Fantastic. yeah. I think, you know, the predictive analytics is really where, uh, is really the next, really the next step, um, rather than just looking back, mm -hmm. and you know this as well as anybody, Avi, so. Uh, all right, great, well thanks so much, uh, Chris, for coming on, really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Uh, inside the Cube, uh, we will be right back in a moment with our next guest.